Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, Funmi, good to see you. I love your backdrop. I don't know what ruin we're outside of, but it's nice. Luxembourg. Excellent. It's always good. It's Luxembourg. See, I've never yes. been to Luxembourg, so now I want to go. <laughs> but thank you for uh, thank you for everybody to join us. This is our uh, somewhat weekly, but not every weekly IP speaker series where we invite distinguished scholars to come and speak to a broader audience. So we invite our our academic friends, and it's so good to see so many of you here. Ruth, hello, and uh, and also the broader public. So we often have um, public officials and various interested people from all over the world, really, doing this online has has enabled us to really reach out um, across as many time zones are, is, is uh, you know, appropriate for this hour. And we're always sorry that it's it's always a bad time somewhere, right? <laughs> it's a good time to as many places as possible. Um, all of, let me just uh, point out a couple of the logistics and, um, and and background for this event series and then turn it over to to Christine to introduce Fumi. But this this series um, is is being recorded and we post all of the recordings on our PIDGEP events page. So if you are interested in any of our past lectures, you can find the public portion of those, of those lectures, which is the first hour and a half on our PIDGEP events page. And almost all of our webcasts, if not all of them, um, are posted there already. It usually takes us a couple weeks to get them out, which is one of the questions we always receive. And that's because we need to sync the, the lecture with the captioning uh, for accessibility purposes. If you do need captioning for accessibility purposes, um, this is being live captioned and you can use, there's a button down at the bottom of your screen, uh, it should be labeled CC to turn on the, uh, turn on the captioning and the videos are captioned automatically. Um, for uh, this part of the session, uh, it, as I mentioned, it is being recorded. And so this is an on the record discussion. But at the end of this session, um, at about uh, 1130 uh, Eastern time, we will end the formal part of the meeting. We'll turn off the cameras, but we'll let you all stay. So if you want to ask more <laughs> informal questions, um, or you want to talk about your pets or show off your kids, that's the portion that we'll do. It's our, it's our um, kind of virtual reception. Uh, but some people like to ask questions in that part as well, especially if you're from government, et cetera, and don't have permission to speak on the record, then that's the spot where you can ask, um, ask your questions if you choose to be um, off the record. So the rule uh, for that latter part is Chatham House rule, which means none of the discussion may be attributed. You may refer to it in your analysis, but you may not attribute the questioner or the speaker. Um, so we run all of these in a, a workshop format, as you can see, which means you're all part of the same space. So we like to run these as a seminar where everybody's is, um, you know, feel free to participate. And toward that end, I would encourage folks, especially in the discussion, to turn on to turn on your cameras if you feel comfortable. It makes um, just a nicer environment for all of us to speak together. It's nicer to see each other. Uh, if you're willing to turn on your or cameras now, that's awesome too. It's it's much nicer for the speaker to look out at a at a, a set of boxes filled by faces instead of just names. So that's. That's for all of us to kind of build community um, together. And I think those are the basic, oh, one more basic rule, which is that you are super welcome to use the chat function to speak with other audience members. Um, and we will uh, be monitoring the chat for questions to integrate into the discussion with Fumi. But Fumi, you are not required to monitor the chat. So. If you're trying to, if you really want to ask a question to Fumi yourself, please actually ask your question, uh, you know, orally, and, and we'll have a system to put up your hands at the end, which is using that little button at the bottom. Um, so feel free to discuss in the chat, but if you're really looking for a question for Fumi, um, please, please ask it uh, directly. So I think those are all the basic rules for the event. And with that, I will turn it over to Christine to introduce Fumi. To you, Christine. Thank you. Um, I guess before I introduce Fumi, just one more logistical um, thing. 
If you have any trouble raising your hand or getting attention to ask a question, you can, um, you can private chat me uh, to get on the queue and let me know. Um, so feel free to do that. Um, so uh, we are so happy to have um, uh, Funmi join us today as our guest speaker. Um, I have never heard her give a presentation where I haven't just been completely wowed, um, both by the topic and her approach and her insights. Um, so I really wanted her to be a part of this series. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm sure her reputation precedes her, but I'm going to give her a short intro anyway, for those of you who, who aren't familiar. Um, she is the Murray H. Schusterman Professor of Transactional and Business Law at Temple Law School. Um, and Fumi is a true polymath. Um, she has expertise in intellectual property, the entertainment industry, technology, Africana studies, business, corporate, finance law. Um, she has, a, in addition to her law degree, she has a master's degree in economics. She has a PhD and anthropology, and if that all weren't enough, she's also a trained classical singer. Um, so let's not compare ourselves to Fumi, please. And that means we have to call her Dr. Arewa. Yes. No. <laughs> um, before she was an academic, she practiced law for a decade, um, focusing on tech startups, and she served um, as CFO and general counsel for a venture capital firm. She has received a number of prestigious fellowships and grants to study uh, law, business, and culture. And she currently serves as an expert, a board member, a consultant for various international organizations working on copyright, technological capacity, venture capital in Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, and in addition to this book project, which she's going to present a chapter on today, um, she has another. Um, book project that she's working on simultaneously. It's under contract with uh, Cambridge University Press, and its title is Disrupting Africa, Technology, Law, and Legal Reform. So I think we need to get her back on the schedule to present one to us next. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted um, that, that she's here. I'm so delighted um, that we've got this great audience for her. Um, so thank you all for coming, and um, and please don't be shy about the discussion. We, we've scheduled enough time that we can really have a robust discussion. So with that, we we'll welcome. Well, thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. So thank you, Christine, Michael, and Sean. Um, I'm really pleased to present this work. Um, as Christ Christine mentioned, I made, I think in retrospect, an unfortunate decision to work on two books at once. So it's been, it's taken me longer, I think, as a result. I have my, my Africa book is actually coming out in September. I was supposed to finish my copy edits today, but I, they gave me until Monday. So after, immediately after this call, I'm gonna run back and finish edits for the Africa book. Now this book, I plan to finish writing over the summer. And this book reflects, I'll talk a little bit about um, the book project and, and give you a little bit of background. Can people see my slides? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna, this is a book called Creating Global Markets for Black Culture, Curation, Music and Law. And it basically is about the fact that African American music, um, a musicologist, Susan McClary, made a she she had a hypothetical that she said if a person were to come and listen to music today, and then go back 150 years and listen to music, they would be really puzzled. Their ears would be puzzled. And I think in some ways we don't recognize it so much because our ears have adjusted to the timbre and sound of African American influenced music. In fact, it's become a dominant source of creativity in popular music worldwide. Um, so my music research has taken me from Germany to the UK to South Korea, and African American music has had a profound impact worldwide. However, it's changed our ears in ways that we don't recognize. And we know that because the very first collectors of slave songs in the United States, 1867 was the first really um, widely distributed collection of slave songs. And one of the things they said in their, in their book is they couldn't figure out how to write down the music because the sounds they heard were, were sounds unlike anything they'd heard before and it wasn't something they could notate. And what they were referring to is timbre. And that's something we still can't really notate. So it's, it's and that has big copyright implications, but the timbre of African American music has contributed to what I call a global takeover of African American music in that it has become a dominant source of uh, innovation in popular music. 
However, the takeover has gone both ways because what my book talks about is with that takeover has come a takeover in the other way and that African-Americans often don't have ownership rights that they should in music that comes out of African-American co uh, context. And so my book is basically grappling with um, borrowing, which many of you know, I've written a lot about borrowing and I'm very pro-borrowing. I think borrowing is important for living cultures. However, bar when, the question I grapple with in this book is when borrowing becomes exploitation. Because if you have systematic borrowings without compensation from particular sources, that becomes something that's more than just borrowing. It's also a, a question of exploitation. And there are issues of attribution and compensation as well. That I'm, I'm going to try to be short in my remarks, so I won't have time to talk about everything. As, I, as usual, I have way too many slides, so I, I'm going to cut to the end of the slide slideshow at some point. So this is an interdisciplinary project and it combines my academic research interest in music, music performance, law, business, technology, anthropology, and folklore. And it's also connected to some other collaborative projects I have about recording contracts and singers. And this actually has a performance co co component, which I'm just starting to get focused on, um, where I'm going to perform some music and hopefully find some other collaborators to perform with me and we'll have a some kind of music recording that's connected to the book. Um, so just this, is, this book project is to, based to a significant degree on archival research. So I spent the last 10 or so years doing archival research for this book and the Africa book. And the geographic focus has been the US, Germany, UK, and South Korea. And what I'm interested, one of the things I've been interested in finding is what I'm, this is an excavation project to try to understand the context of music creation and music performance in other times and places. Um, and so this is this is just gives you a sense of my table of contents. The book is, is separated basically into three sections. One, the first section talks about live performance cultures. The second section really focuses on the recording industry, so records and radio. And the third section talks about the imp importance of visuality today with music. Um, since the, it actually happened before MTV in some ways because we had film and television where music was presented in visual context. And I think TikTok is sort of the current iteration of what's an important aspect of visuality in music. One thing I do in the book is go back in the, 18th, in the 19th century and look at minstrelsy sheet music. That was very hard archival research because spending one or two days in an archive just use it, looking at minstrel sheet music, the, the images are really quite quite bad, um, but it's an important aspect of the visual aspect of music. So the last part of the book um, talks about from analog to digital sound and visual culture. So it talks both about the transition to digital as well as the importance of visual images connected to music, be they still images on sheet music or the kind of really interesting music stuff we see on TikTok now. So that gives you an overview of the book. So. Um, and I won't talk about the performance project. We can ans answer that in Q and A. So I want to talk about my ref my research focus generally. So um, my research focuses on three things, and I uh, and hopefully this will come out in the presentation. One. Um, I'm taking a close look at contract terms and many, I'm not the, I'm not, this is, doesn't come from me. There, there are pe when people talk about recording contracts, um, some people argue that they're based on what we refer to, what you might refer to as a sharecropper model in that um, it's a kind of model that you wouldn't use for someone you, you have a partnership with, um, but it's, it's, it's a sharecropper model. I'll talk more about that later. Um, the other thing I look, look at is compensation to creators. And African American creators throughout a lot of, throughout a lot of American history have been marginalized. But it's not just marginalized people that are complaining about compensation and recording industry contract terms. Taylor Swift has really emerged. She's one of the most successful musicians of our time, has really emerged as a, as a pretty strong critic of the way music recording contracts work, particularly in her case with respect to ownership of her master recordings. So if we have a situation where marginalized creators are complaining and some of the most successful creators are complaining, I think that tells us something about the contractual terms going back to the sharecropping model. And one of the most interesting things we've seen lately, I'm not sure if many of you looked at Kanye West dumped all his contracts on the internet. So it gives us an opportunity to look at what are the contractual terms for a pretty prominent um, performer. Uh, and and well, he, he's sort of a mega artist. He does all kinds of things. Um, and the contract terms, I it's over 100 pages. I haven't finished looking through it. But it's actually, for uh, since music contracts are hard to find, they're often locked up in recording um, company uh, archives. So we can't really get access to this key source of material for understanding our culture or past. And it's not just the contracts, the masters are also locked up, which is, I think, becoming a bigger issue for our cultural heritage, especially after the Universal Fire in 2008, which destroyed a lot of our cultural heritage in terms of masters. The masters that weren't released where we don't have other copies of, we can never get that back. 
and that's something that's we that's part of my interrogation and discussion because I think we also need to look at cultural institutions and how we would preserve our cultural heritage because I don't think we're doing what we need to do in terms of our recording heritage because some of our recording heritage is just one single master that's hidden somewhere sometimes they don't even know that it's there because they aren't really kept very in a very um, organized way um, the last thing I want to talk about this part of this project is borrowing in zones of acceptable use and I, and I talk about from Handel to bear, uh, blurred lines in the time of Handel um, people talked about how uh, he borrowed too much. They felt, really felt like borrowing was pervasive in Baroque music, but everyone felt like well, whatever whatever is acceptable, he did too much. One of the things I would say, we we now um, composers were big. Uh, fans of copy, applying copyright to music as the patronage system broke down and they were exposed to commercial markets. One of the things we see is that I, I'm not sure we're getting the right kind of compensation to creators. Moreover, I don't think we're getting clarification about zones of acceptable use. So if we go from Handel to blurred lines, I don't think blurred lines really clarifies things, regardless of what you, whether you feel like the decision was right or not right. I tend to go with the side that says, I don't think it was right, but I, I understand why it happened. But I don't think we have real clarification about what acceptable zones of borrowing are to the extent that we should. So with that, let me just talk about um, it. I have some key questions. So key questions in this pr presentation is industry contracts and systematic undercompensation of African-American artists. And I'm also interested in the ecosystem um, of intermediaries surrounding music, segregation in the music industry um, and uh, music industry practices that tend to limit African-American artists to particular genres that are considered to be black. We might think of this as historical related to race records, but Old Town Road shows us it's alive and living today. Um, and um, the, uh, the one key question is the role of varied intermediaries and the role of copyright underlying all this. So who actually registers copyright and who are they? Um, because sometimes people are shocked when I say in my presentation, well, random people just registered copyright for a lot of African-American performers. It, was, it might've been the recording scout. It might've been some random um, industry executive. It doesn't take a lot of digging and interrogation to realize that that person was not a creator. And the question I think we have to ask from a copyright perspective is when we see those kinds of situations, how do we deal with them legally? Because African-Americans did not have recourse of civil uh, actions um, during the early recording era. They couldn't go to court and say, this person you know, did me wrong or ripped me off because the racial environment in the United States was e extremely violent. Um, people were lynched. And when you talk to people who were alive in that era, challenging a white person in court was just not feasible. And I don't think we've really come to terms with that reality in copyright. And I think we need to look at the implications of that more, more carefully. Um, we also need to look at the racial impact of copyright law provisions like cover recordings. Cover recordings are seemingly neutral, but in certain parts of the recording industry, they've been used to systematically deprive African-American performers of access to broader markets. And that's a racial impact of something that is not, not, was not, was not, it wasn't, they wouldn't put into place for racial reasons, but they have a disp disp disparate racial impact that I think we need to think about and talk about. And the other point is copy copyright enforcement and race in that, particularly in earlier eras, um, African-American performers didn't have the same ability to enforce copyright law provisions or to enforce um, seemingly exploitative uh, activities in, in connection to copyright. And this is an issue that may be ongoing. One of the things that, that um, I was on a panel last year and um, with a, a, an African-American lawyer, a lawyer who rep has represented a lot of African-American artists. And um, one of the things I'm looking at now is the extent to which we see differential use of legal provision, legal um, sanctions like rule 11 um, in cases involving African-American artists, because at least one person has asserted that they think that Rule 11 sanctions tend to be used more today in cases either involving African-American artists or in cases, this is terminate, mostly co copyright termination cases I'm talking about, or in cases that where they're African-American lawyers. And that that's something I'm trying to explore empirically, but that raises some interesting questions about the extent to which um, some of those trend, patterns we saw in the early recording era, era are, are being recast and uh, evident in different ways today. And this book uh, focuses a lot about curation, how we select, represent, edit, and display music and other forms of culture. Um, so, and I'm giving you this background because I'm going to skip a lot of slides so you can know under bottom line what I want, what I want to talk about. Now, when we think about recording industry compensation, the first thing we usually think about is what are the contractual terms? So that includes things like royalty rates, recruitment, ownership of masters, there's a typo there, exclusivity, those kinds of things. But we also have to think about royalty accounting because no matter what, one thing we know in terms of contractual terms is African-American artists, at least during the R&B era where we do have some data, appear to have been paid 50, oh, 40 to 60% of standard rates that other artists receive. So we know that royalty rates were less, but it's not just royalty rates 
that are relevant here. It's also how you account for royalties, because no matter what your royalty rate entitlement is, the recording industry actually accounts for who, what royalties you're able to receive. And one thing we know is that there's a systematic, um, uh, there, there are errors in, mo when you do an audit, if you can afford to do an audit, there tend to be errors and almost all the errors are in favor of the recording industry. And this is a systematic pattern that's been going on for decades. Um, one, one, one audit specialist, and I think this is in, in a California legislative hearings, basically said an audit finding that an artist has been overpaid is like a Bigfoot sighting. So almost all of the overpayments are in favor of the recording industry. So this is something that's very systematic that I think we need to think about legally. How do we, is this something that we need, really need to leave to a contract by contract accounting process that is expensive and long drawn given that it's systematic and widespread practice. Um, the other thing that we need to take account of is many artists receive their health and retirement benefits based on royalty payments. These, this is for recorded singers with AFTRA, um, which is SAG-AFTRA now, which is the union. If you're a recorded singer, you're automatically a member of AFTRA. After are supposed to, the AFTRA um, funds are supposed to oversee your health and retirement benefits. And as it turns out, we, we know in a lot of instances that, that they didn't. So if we look at Ruth Brown, her, um, she worked with Howell Beagle, who was an MA attorney, actually, the late Howell Beagle, to basically put the um, shine a light of shame on the recording industry because they were assessing all kinds of costs against R&B artists. So when R&B artists went to them, who not, many of whom had never, hadn't received royalty payments in years, when they went to them and said, I, I think I, I'm owed royalties, the recording industry would say, well, you owe us $45,000 because that you, they, they assessed all these costs. And it turned out it was totally untrue. Um, and they were assessing costs that were not, you couldn't be assessed pursuant to the contract. But when we have a contract by contract norm of, of auditing, you, it's hard to fix those kinds of things because many of those people are not in a position to, to, to pay for or seek an audit. Um, we also know from the Mary Wells and Sam, and Moore, Sam, Sam Moore of Sam and Dave case, is that the lack of payment of royalties and the lack of accounting has, has uh, broader consequences. When Mary Wells fell ill with cancer, which that she later, later died from, she was first told that she had no health, health insurance. And the reason she didn't have health insurance had to do with an old dispute that she had with Motown and how Motown, how that dispute was settled, but she wasn't getting credited the royalty she was, she was entitled to. So she lost her home. Um, she was facing hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical expenses because she had very advanced um, uh, cancer of the larynx. Eventually, um, she got health insurance and the industry really rallied around her, Bonnie Raitt in particular, um, a lot of artists it rallied around her. Um, and, but, but royalties are not just a matter of how much you get paid, it's also about your health and retirement benefits. Sam Moore, when he retired, when he sought to find out how much he was entitled to, was told he was only entitled to a flat fee of $1,600 at retirement. And so he actually sued and the Sam and Moore, the, the uh, Moore case against after, the after funds was settled ultimately. Um, but there there's a huge, huge number of people that could have been mem a member of that class action if they'd been certified. And uh, this work on recording industry contract compensation is joint work with Matt, Matt Stahl, just a call out. He wrote Unfree Masters, and he has a forthcoming article on Kesha that many people might find interesting. Okay, so let's talk about, I'm going to briefly rush through, not rush through, I'm going to try to speak more slowly. I get excited, I get so excited about this, I talk too fast. Um, I'm going to talk about Black music as category, then curation, and then curation, authority, and law. And then I'm going to open it up for questions. So the Black music category is constructed. I don't think this is going to come as a surprise to anyone. What I want to look at is how it's constructed. And, um, and I think it's constructed by it has been constructed by different people at different points in time. So we've, um, and let me, let me move on to that slide. And I, I think many of you have probably heard Old, Old Town Road, so I'm not going to play the song. But Old Town Road is the um, rap country crossover hit that actually came out of TikTok and it shows us in an important way how TikTok is changing music. Um, but the popularity of this song led to greater visibility of longstanding record ind industry practices in that they manipulate charts. Um, record charts, we think record charts are subjective, right? Because they list things in numerical order. You could, but we could attach a number to anything. But I think somehow psychologically, if we attach a number to something, it has, it seemingly has more validity. One of the things we, f we, we know about recording industry charts is that they reflect um, existing social hierarchies and zones of exclusion and discrimination. We know that in part because um, Old Town Road shows us this. Old Town Road appeared on the Billboard Hot 100, which is the big 
general chart, the hot R&B hip hop chart, which is the chart where usually if you're an African-American musician, this is the chart that usually gets get placed on. It also played uh, uh, was placed on the hot country songs chart, but then it was removed. Um, in March 2019, Billboard said, well, we're going to take it off the hot country chart. And they say, this is quoted in Rolling Stone, they say, while Old Town Road incorporates references to country and cowboy imagery, it does not embrace enough elements of today's country music to chart in its current version. Now, what that means, we don't know until they came out with this statement. By the way, this exclusion has nothing to do with race, which, I mean, underscores, if you thought it had to do with race, I think probably you now know it has to do with race. So this received widespread attention because African American music of African Americans um, created by African Americans and um, performed by African Americans are categorized into genres that are not considered white. And genres that are considered white are country music, folk music, and rock and roll. Even today, these categories are considered to be white genres. So if you're an African American musician who either sings wholly in those categories or crosses over, you may not be actually be able to categorize as that. Um, and it's not, it, not surprising that this exclusion occurred with a country rock, rap crossover because country music has long grappled with the African-American, the fact that country music evolved out of um, mixed music, especially black influences and blues. Um, and Jocelyn Neal, who has a really interesting book about Jimmy Rogers, um, talks about this. And I think it's really important to think about this, but it's not just country music. We've had a lot of controversies in co country music about race, but the same things exist with respect to rock and roll. So um, the same article talks about um, Juice World, the late Juice World, who died in 2019, unfortunately. Um, um, Juice World's work is, is very much like rock and roll, but Juice World is not, he's, he, um, the, in this article, Elias Lake goes on to say, you won't find Juice World on Spotify's premier rock playlist, which is dominated by white artists. So rock and roll is also considered to be a white genre. And I'm not gonna play this, sorry. And folk music, Odetta, who was, who was considered the voice of the civil rights movement. She was a significant influence on Bob Dylan and Joan Baez. She's actually not listed in the Wikipedia entry for American folk music because folk music is one of those categories, even though African-Americans were heavily involved in it. And a lot of people in folk music will point back to African-American influences. Folk music is, has been categorized as a white music genre. Um, and this is, um, curation can happen at different points in time. So, um, and, I just want to point out that there's a lot of lot more scrutiny about the um, contractual terms. So the Black Lives Matters and the Black Music Action Coalition have pointed to adver really adverse contractual terms that have existed for a long time. We know in December, BMG announced it reviewed its catalogs contracts for racial discrimination. It didn't tell us what the outcome was, but we know that they they actually found discrimination in four of their 33 catalogs, and they say they. They plan to bring forward measures which will benefit the lowest paid record, recording artist across all of its catalogs. Now, I hope they'll make some of this public. There's a lot of secrecy in terms of recording contracts and recording contract terms. Um, so briefly talk about curation. So cura I think a lot of what we think about as cat the category of black music relates to curation. And it's, it's a term I take from the visual arts. It originally started there. It's however widely used in music today. So we talk about curating Spotify playlists. We talk about uh, curation in terms of music, um, live music performance. Um, and it's a characteristic aspect of the selection and representation of music. And I would argue, also argue law that's shaped by conceptions of what culture is or should be. So it involves sec selection, representation, and display, and it may also involve editing. Um, and it shapes music genres and categories, who's authorized to play, conceptions of musical authenticity and musical representation, what people collect, and how people categorize music. And I think just briefly talk about um, I'm, I'll talk about my curation practice in, in Q&A, but I wanted to point people to the book by Clover Hope that just came out. It's called The Motherlode. It's really a deep interrogation of women that made hip hop music, women's contribution to hip hop music. And it really, I think, because hip hop is curated, a lot of times uh, people curate, cur curate out the women. And that's not just true of hip hop. It was also true of blues divas, women in rock and roll. Um, and so I think gender and curation is, I talk about it in one chapter, but I think it's something we need to, that we, need to think about and talk about more. And this book I think is really, really interesting for anyone that's interested in hip hop or curation and gender. Um, so a lot, of, so the origins, uh, uh, minstrelsy is, represents a form of curation, right? There was a 19th century minstrel craze of um, people, mostly white people, but black people also wore blackface, mostly white people dressing up in blackface and pretending to be black and sort of performing in ways that were very um, stereotyped and demeaning. 
Um, and I think minstrelsy, and, and it, there's a really funny anecdote, well, not so funny, there's an interesting anecdote of uh, Ethiopian serenaders. They um, released pictures of themselves just to show that they were white. And you have to think about the, you, the American culture at the time, right? A lot of African-Americans were slaves in the South and privately owned by people. So they didn't have a lot of public presence to the extent, um, to, to a significant extent. So they released photos of themselves just to show that they were actually white people painting black on their face um, because there wasn't a lot of uh, visibility of African-American people at that point in time. And I think that's an important aspect of curation because if you're curating culture of marginalized people um, who don't have the ability to represent themselves and who actually aren't very present, that gives those kinds of curators a lot of power. And this is just a, to give you a sense of some of the sheet music demeaning images. I wanna contrast this sheet music uh, visualization of African-Americans later with, a, uh, the, with, with the banjo lesson by Henry Osawa Turner, which is a, who was one of the leading Amer African-American uh, painters of the 19th century. So curation is much more possible today because we have a lot of technology that gives us access to any music that's ever been uh, uh, recorded, we have access to today. Um, so in the, in the recording era, we had contemporaneous curation by recording scouts, folklorists, such as the Lomax family, um, later curation by record collectors, and other later musicians, British rock and roll musicians, for instance, had have basically contributed to what we can to a broader, have shaped broader understanding of early blues as being solo black male guitar players. But the actual musical environment of the 1920s and early blues had a lot of other people other than that, including a lot of women who sort of got curated out in terms of the representation of what what early blues was. Um, so I'm not gonna talk, I could talk more, I just have one chart to show us really important influential figures in early blues and later eras, including H.C. Spire, who, um, who recorded Robert, uh, Robert Johnson, Ralph Peer, who um, recorded the Carter family, Jimmy Rogers, Mamie Smith, at, particularly in Bristol, Tennessee, and it was 1927 or 1928, I, don't quote me on years, he recorded, he, the Carter family was, the origin of what we consider of modern country music was in his, the recordings that he curated, including the Carter, Carter family and Jimmy Rogers. Um, we had folklorists such as John and Alan Lomax, who curated uh, Huddy Ledbetter, also known as Leadbelly, and McK McKinley Morganfield, Muddy Waters. And then Mayo Williams was one of the few African-American um, record producers. Um, he worked at Paramount, a number of different places. And there were a number of artists that he also recorded, including Ma Rainey, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Alberta Hunter, Mahalia Jackson, um, Kokomo Arnold. So we had a lot of intermediaries. So a lot of my book is about the role of intermediaries and how we, think, how we should be thinking about these intermediaries and record collectors, particularly the record collectors. Amanda Petrushik has a really interesting book about these people that went around. So blues records were made on 78s. Um, and they were popular music at the time they were black, targeted at the African-American community. So a lot of these recording uh, record collectors would go knocking on doors in African-American community, communities and buying old 78s. And it, it's really interesting. Amanda Petrusik says that basically, um, talks about how, but Robert Johnson was in fact not a huge star of his time. Other blues singers like Barbecue Bob were commercially way more successful in the African-American community. It just happened to be that Robert Johnson's the guy who got lionized by collectors in part because he's an incredible tar tar um, talent, but also something about what he was doing made sense to these white men who were in charge of gathering, preserving and digitizing the records. It's interesting that the narratives we think of as being historical are in fact really personal. And I think that's important to think about because this kind of curation shapes our conception today of what culture was in the past. We're sifting, constantly sifting culture through sometimes very personal narratives, which is not necessarily wrong, but I think it's important to recognize it as such. Um, so curation and the curation would also uh, involve, there was also destruction in terms of shaping what our cultural heritage today is today, because in World War II, um, popular culture for a long time has been seen as very, as, as essentially ephemeral. So in, in World War II, they wanted to recycle shellac and some of, some of the masters were metal. So they basically destroyed a lot of masters at the time of World War II. That's one reason we don't have any pre-1935 radio shows that are preserved because they were basically destroyed in World War II. Um, what was destroyed, I don't think we really have a good sense of. They also destroyed old 78s to recycle this shellac. So our, our shaping of music today is shaped by both curation and destruction. And I think that 2008 Universal Fire, um, I don't think we still know 
everything that was destroyed, but it's destroyed a significant portion of our uh, of uh, important recording masters. So how does how did curation impact uh, creativity? It impacted creativity. The Black Hillbillies are an example of how it impacted creativity. Um, these are old pictures of Black Hillbillies. We know that um, half of string bands at the turn of the century were Black. String bands are sort of the evolved into what we think of as country music today. Half of them were Black. Today, people think about country music essentially, essentially being a white musical category. How did that happen? A lot of it was recording industry curation. So record scouts went out and they said, if you're Black, you need to record race music, which was blues. They said, that's authentic Black music. If you want to, if you do string bands, that's white music. That's rural white music. You would, so not many Black string bands were actually recorded at the time. Um, and I'm going to skip my discussion of instruments, but I wanted to did, did want to point out the Harry, Henry Osawa Turner depiction of the banjo versus the minstrel sheet music depiction. These kinds of visual Im images have long played an important um, role in the curation and representation of music. So I'm going to wrap up soon. I wanted to say um, a couple of things. I'm going to skip. If you haven't already heard either the Ebony Hillbillies or the Carolina Chocolate Drops, I urge you to go out and listen to them. Um, Joe Thompson, who died in 2012, was a fiddle player who was credited with preserving the Black string band tradition. When Carolina Chocolate Drops were formed, they actually went to him and were mentored by him. And there's actually a video of them available on YouTube playing with um, Joe Thompson before he died. Um, so, and I'm, so I think where, where I'll end is I want to talk about curation by the Lomax family. Um, and I'll, I can share my slides with you for those of you that are interested in some of the slides I'm missing. So John, John Lomax was a folklorist and he was a significant cultural and academic authority with respect to African-American culture. His curation involved stereotypic images and assumptions with an emphasis on primitivism. But he had a very influential role because he um, helped shape our cultural institutions. He was involved with both the Smithsonian and Library of Congress and helped assemble their collections of our cultural heritage. And this is a, a a, a passage from his book, he painted himself as being a, an intrepid ballad hunter. Um, and he basically said, these songs and the other I heard that day, I shall carry in my heart forever. Uh, and those earnest black faced boys dressed in grisly gray stripes who sang them. I shall never forget the reaction from a high pitch of emotional excitement gave me a sleepless night. Um, so he went and collected in, in prisons from incarcerated people. And his book is full of all kinds of discussions of how many black people were in prison in that time period. Like he went to a women's prison and he said, you know, I don't know, there are 500 prisoners and only five of them are white. Um, this was a place and, and all of the white prisoners had committed murder, I think. And he, he um, sort of normalized that. He, this is a, a receipt from his going to see Huddy Ledbetter at the Louisiana State uh, Penitentiary. Um, he sought to co collect authentic black music and thousands of inmates were brought to him in chains, were brought to him in chains to be recorded. Now we don't, it doesn't necessarily reflect what he, what he collected is important that he preserved it, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the music actually being played. Um, and it was also collected in questionable circumstances. Um, so the fundamental question that this raises is who has the authority to define and represent black, black culture? What's the allocation of resources in varied settings and how law intersects with questions of cultural authority and voice? Um, so I wanna highlight the distinction between um, uh, John Lomax and uh, Zora Neale Hurston, who was a folklorist trained by Franz Boas, who, who actually worked with John and, and Alan Lomax in their collections. One thing that they sort of leave out of their narratives a lot of times is how much they relied on African-American researchers and collaborators who ended up getting written out to a significant degree. The contrast between Hurston's and Lomax's careers and employment with the Federal Writers Project um, imp epitomizes the racial, radical racial inequality of this era and is indicative of African-Americans' lack of institutional authority to represent Black culture and identity. And this was true across a, a broad range of cultural spheres. Um, so in, uh, Hurston, even though she sought to preserve, had a fundamentally different view. In a letter to Langston Hughes, she says, Negro folklore is still in the making um, and a new kind is crowding out the old. So she had a somewhat different attitude as she saw it as a living culture in ways that Lomax didn't. He wanted to preserve something to put it in a museum. So I'll end with talking about uses of law. So this, we have an ecosystem surrounding 
um, particularly the, the dispute between Ledbetter and Lomax, John Lomax, an ecosystem supporting exploitation in which publishing and record companies were entirely aware of and accepting of Lomax's behavior. Um, we have recording contracts and mechanicals, um, copyright assignments. Uh, what the producer said at the time was they wanted to do flat payments because they wanted to avoid dealing with mechanicals. They also claim their own copyright, so not sure that was really the uh, an accurate excuse. Um, cover recordings of racial impact in segregated music markets. I want to end by taking a look at the contract that um, Lomax had Ledbetter um, sign um, the minute he arrived in New York. He said, within a week of arriving, this is from his biography, within a week of their arrival in New York City, Lomax and Leadbelly signed an agreement that made Lomax his manager and agent for five years with a share of 50% of all Leadbelly. Belly's earnings. After the meeting, Lomax noted, he sung us one song, which I saw copyright as soon as I get to Washington and try to market in cheap music form. And what he ended up doing, um, let's take a look at this contract. Um, Lead Belly not, was also their chauffeur. Um, so there was an assumption that he would be a, he would ser be a service, so a service personnel. So this is um, just a, a letter from Ledbetter's attorney, but this is the actual contract. Um, where he, he agrees to give uh, Lomax 50% of all monies earned by him from any musical engagements. And on the back side, there's a little side that says, well, for $1 additional consideration, we'll actually increase that to two thirds because Alan's gonna help out. Um, so, and this contract was all of the people that, uh, that Lomax dealt with, um, the American Record Company, Macmillan Company, they were all aware of what was going on. And so this it forms part of an exosystem that supported exploitation. So let me stop here. I've, I've gone a little over time. I want to, I love to, I welcome your questions and thoughts. That was amazing. That was so, gosh, there's so much there for me. Thank you so much. Um, we're, we're, thank you for the, <laughs> the, the audience reactions. Um, okay, so now we have an opportunity to ask questions, um, share thoughts on these, uh, these many topics. And um, you were kind enough to note all the things that you were just gonna put off to the side um, for discussion. So hopefully we can get back to those. Um, so let me, um, let me begin with Paige. Hi, first of all, oh my gosh, that was so fantastic. You made my week. Thank you. Oh, God. Um, Good. <laughs> um, I love hearing so much brought together. So this made me think a lot about the potential significance of metadata that is used to describe music and music genres, particularly in different commercial systems like Spotify and Pandora, which of course has the Music Genome Project, which is proprietary in terms of how it describes music. And it seems to me like there's a lot at stake in who gets to describe music and who can control that and to what degree those systems are open or controlled. And I just was wondering whether that's something that has come that intersects with what you're working on at all. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it intersects. One of the things I'm in the process is as I finalize the book, I mean, I'm trying to figure out how much I can talk about in one book because my consistent problem is I, I have like a broad vision of what I want to talk about, but it, it probably maybe would be better spoken about in two or three books. Absolutely. That gives the power today more than ever because we have curated playlists like Spotify, going back to Juice World, Spotify is curated such that he's not included. So he's not, off, often when people are African-American performers or composers, they're categorized in, let's say, urban music. And that kind of categorization uh, has broader implications. It, it, it has commercial implications because it has impl implications for musical discovery. If, you can, if, you're, if you're constrained to a narrow category, you may have less reach and end up getting fewer streams because people use those playlists to decide how to stream. So I think right. certainly there's a story to tell about curation in digital worlds. I'm not sure how much I will tell it, but I think this sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll write a note to myself that I need to link to that more because I think absolutely, and this is why these kinds of patterns continue because yeah. I don't think, uh, we, we, we shouldn't have needed Black Lives Matter to tell us that we have continuing patterns of racial, um, not just discrimination, racial oppression, racial violence. Um, that continue and they continue in all kinds of ways that are we don't question and I think it's important to interrogate and question them. 
particularly when AI is involved in, in classifying, but that is a whole other thing. Thank you very much. It, it touches on algorithm, al algorithmic bias as well. Um, Luke. Thank you uh, for me for an amazing lecture. I'm tuning in from London, by the way, so uh, you have an international audience today. Um, <laughs> you know, really amazing presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions about different types of ownership. So, um, you know, one type of ownership concerns heritage and, you know, the question of cultural appropriation and you know, uh, in my own research about Irish traditional music and authorship and, mm -hmm. and um, copyright, you know, one of the, the fascinating uh, stories was about how, uh, you know, in, in the, the, the illustrations you showed of, of the minstrel shows from the 19th century, several of those musicians who were wearing blackface would have been Irish musicians, um, emigrants to the United States. And, um, you know, in the famous kind of thesis from the 90s, how the Irish became white, it was partially through uh, discrimination towards uh, black people and other races that they became accepted as part of kind of white America. And there's the, the incorporation of the banjo into Irish traditional music dates from that time and from those, those, those minstrel shows. But there was also an interesting kind of corollary to this last year via TikTok, which was the story of Morgan Bullock. I'm not sure if, if you followed it, but uh, she's an amazing African-American Irish dancer who, who you know, has no connection to Ireland in terms of her own personal heritage, but fell in love with the music and, and did these amazing TikTok videos of her dancing the Irish traditional style, but to Beyonce and to modern music and some hip hop influences. And, you know, it created this huge sensation, this interest in Irish traditional dancing. And, uh, you know, there was a positive kind of reaction to that um, in, in many quarters, both in Ireland and in the Irish traditional dancing community. She was in, invited to join Riverdance as a guest oh, wow. uh, okay. dancer. Um, but on the other hand, you know, in, in inevitably in the social media age, she also got, um, you know, racist comments for, for, from some people um, essentially saying, you know, this is not your heritage and you're appropriating uh, Irish heritage, you know, so that there's a kind of never ending story here of, 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 of culture and different hierarchies and so on that, that you know, you, your research really does so much to, to, to help us kind of see through. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask you, so, yeah, so I wanted to ask you what you thought about that and, 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 and whether you've also noticed those connections. Uh, the second question is much sh shorter, which is, did anyone ever challenge these Lomax copyrights in court? Because they strike me as very spurious. And, you know, in Europe, where we don't have a registration system and, and, and never really did, um, uh, you know, we, you, that sort of thing wouldn't really arise where the, the person who recorded the song would go down to the office and kind of claim ownership of it. So were they ever challenged in court or, or did Lomax kind of get away with that kind of sense of ownership? You know, th those are great questions, first of all. Um, the first one about heritage, I think is an ongoing discussion about culture generally, because culture cultures are much more hybrid than people are often willing to admit. For instance, you talked about the banjo being incorporated into Irish traditional music, which is interesting because it, it, I'm assuming it came from Africa to the US and then came from the US to Ireland, but it would be interesting. I don't know if anyone studied that. That would be a very interesting uh, thing to study. I think the, the, oh, the establishment of ownership rights has implications for the underlying cultural traditions where there was a lot of sharing and common common, sh common sharing of a tradition that was a live tradition where we didn't have ownership rights. Once you have ownership rights, people almost sometimes treat it like a gold rush. We certainly saw that with rural music in the 1920s. And then it becomes a question of how does that copyrighted music relate to the existing traditions? One of the things that A.J. Carter did of the Carter family, he went around to rural um, areas in the South and and found, took composition credits for music that comes out of the tr traditional, tr that for tr traditional songs and other types of music, he copyrighted it. So I think sometimes copyright will end up establishing what I call the gold rush mentality. Everyone wants to rush out and establish ownership rights. I think that becomes very problematic in context where, um, in, in the context of early blues, for instance, I think that was very problematic because you ended up going, going to your second question, you ended up with copyrights that were very questionable. I'm not sure, I'm not sure we had any contemporaneous 
questioning of the copyrights. I've been doing trying to do a very detailed search of legal cases. These legal cases are very hard to find um, because sometimes they were just lawsuits. And um, there are issues of curation related to law in terms of publication of court decisions. A lot of things that we might find weren't published. And they might have been disputed in places like estate courts, where the heirs are disputing the, the original copyright. Um, what we have seen is a second generation of dispute. I'm not, if it, at the time, I'm still looking for some of those disputes. I don't know if I have any clear dispute in the 1920s. The Bessie Smith heirs sued, but it was like 70 years later. Um, we do have cases involving people that were assigned rights. So we, we had a what I call multiple layers of exploitation. So a lot of people um, signed away copyrights to the extent they had rights, they weren't, they weren't paid. So they ended up uh, recruiting people called royalty recovery experts to help them collect royalties in exchange for uh, 25 to 50% of the royalties. Now it was almost impossible to get out of those royalty recovery expert cases. So there are a lot of cases in federal court involving those people that we're actually with Matt Stahl, we're looking at those. Um, one of the most uh, well-known examples of those is the agreement between Robert Johnson's stepsister and, and Stephen LeVere, which, which ended up being when they found Robert Johnson's heir, when Robert Johnson's son was declared his heir, that agreement was um, was ended, but he, Stephen Levere got 50% of the Robert Johnson royalties because of that agreement. And that wasn't uncommon. So we have multiple layers of exploitation, but those are great questions. And that gives me a sense of things to, uh, ways I can talk about this issue because the broader issues of what the cultural heritage is and how it's collected, that's, uh, um, that's maybe a non-commercial question, but I think I would, I would, I think would be really interesting to look at what, what's in the archives that was collected by these people because this is taken as representative of cultural heritage. It may be in some ways, but I think it was certainly a selective process that actually did not involve any, for the, for the most part, involved no African-American people in the case of the United States. Um, I uh, have neglected my private queue, so I want to uh, turn to that, and I want to invite you all in the queue, but we have to run out, um, and I need to shift the order. Just let me know in the chat. Um, so, Ruth. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Michael and, and Sean and Christine for this, and of course to Fumi. Um, I feel like I have lived this book. Um, I get texts from Fumi over for over a decade, like over the course of a decade, right? Um, and she has traveled to. She, wow, you won't believe what I just found. And um, you know, she's just excavating away, and I just love it. For me, I just really, as you know, I, you know, I love this project, and and um, it's been fun to to be on it with you, but. I wanted to ask one thing you didn't tell this audience that I've always found fascinating is really the connection um, between the um, royalty question um, and the essentially the um, incentives to exploit um, black music um, for purposes of structuring the market in a particular way. And you didn't really mention that in this talk. I know you've mentioned it in other talks, but I wanted to invite you to do that because I think um, from some of the questions that you've already gotten, this is sort of covered really richly um, in this book. And I think it's a really important point. Um, but my question um, really has to do with something you and I have been talking about and that is the role of contracts. Um, all of this exploitation is facilitated in ways that are ostensibly legal. And it's far easier to sort of attack and critique and um, kind of point to um, um, the ways in which exploitation and oppression have taken place, but it's the tool is legal. And so what, what do you think, and, and we started talking about this last week and we didn't finish, but what do you think is the way we rejigger the contract system, right? Like how do we do this in a way that actually opens space? And, and, and this is a huge, problem because as you know whenever there's an industry practice it becomes part and parcel of the way contracts are interpreted so the the fact that this is just normal is in is viewed from a contract law perspective as a way to just reinforce um, the kind of inequities that you that you've unearthed and that you've you've analyzed and and I just I find that if we don't pay attention to what's happening in the contract field um, we will just um, let the tool stay what it is. And no matter how much evidence we find of misuse, we actually get no change in the system. So I just wanted you to kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, those are those are huge questions that, that I touch on in this research, but I think that we need to think about maybe a, 
uh, more systematic research plan to, to rethink this, because I think this is at the core of copyright, not just how copyright exists in law, but how copyright is applied in practice. So to address your first question, I think we often think, you know, the standard line about copyright is that it, it, the whole idea, reason we have copyright is that it gives incentives to, for people to create. Um, I'm not sure we have the empirical space of whether that's true in the kind of context we're talking about, I think is really questionable. I think what it does give people is incentives to exploit. And I think what, what, what we have in this context is what I call a gold rush mentality. So there's gold there in the rural, rural spaces. Let's go get it. And I think that implications of that for creators have been fairly adverse. So this is a question of, um, I have another project related to Africa where we're talking about adverse inclusion in markets. So this is a, an example of adverse inclusion. I think, um, although some people argue African-Americans are better off, I think as a, as a counterfactual, we'd have to look at a, a scenario where African-Americans actually have control over their, their cultural product. And we're seeing that to a greater extent today. And we're seeing that it is, it's enormously enriching. The question is who gets enriched by, from culture? Is it the actual creators? If we say copyright's there to incentivize creators, I think we need to look empirically at what are creators actually getting? And what does this royalty system actually do? And I don't think creators are getting what we think they're getting or what we say they're getting. Um, I think the Wall Street Journal had an interesting article last week or the week before where they talked about, um, I think 80% of proceeds go to the recording, com recording companies and streaming today. And with the composition credit, which I think is where people normally would try to get more money. We have on average five, more than five people getting uh, comp composition credits today versus 2.1 20 years ago. So that composer's piece is being split before, between more and more people, partly because performers figured out that's where you get money um, relative to the recording. So they're actually claiming, com if, if I'm a very prominent performer, I claim, I claim to be, a, I, I'm a songwriter on the song so I can get a piece of the composition part. Traditional songwriters, let me call them that, are not getting the piece that they would have gotten 20 or 30 years ago. And we're also seeing that recoupment is, uh, people are also starting to try to apply recoupment to the composition piece, which is something that hadn't been traditionally the case. So I think we're, we have to really seriously look at the economics because I think the economics of the industry are totally out of sync with what we say about copyright and copyright incentives to, to the point where it's just, just glaring. And I think that gets to your second point about contracts. Contracts play a role in this. So I think we need to think about legal theories Clearly, those early copyrights shouldn't be valid, in my view. I think there, there are all kinds of reasons why those early copyrights were, were not valid um, and, and why they were never challenged, because I think to a significant degree, it was rural people, rural black people or rural white people that um, were poor. So, you know, $50 sounds pretty good. If you're, you know, some of this is happening during the depression, people are starving. I mean, so it probably seemed like a pretty good economic deal. I think to some extent in country music, the growth of Nashville is is partly a reclaiming of some you know, ownership rights that um, the recording industry had taken away. I think the question we, have, we, we need to think about is what kind of doctrines can we use to challenge the worst part of these contractual practices? Where I would start is with the accounting because it seems to me that systematic accounting where you're, uh, where you're accruing cost to multiple people that don't belong to them that should actually be accrued to you so that they should be getting more money, that sounds like fraud to me. I think they're, they're all, and it sounds like something very systematic. So that's not something I think that should be resolved on a contract by contract basis. I think we need legal theories to capture that because I think it's, it's not fair to put or just to put that on the a burden on individual artists to resolve that. Because if you're entering into a contract as a recording company, knowing that you systematically deprive people of royalties, and you know, I've written about Hollywood accounting too. It's the same with Hollywood net profits. It's systematic and it's widespread. So I think we need better legal theories for dealing with the contract side, because we have, um, we have in copyright, we have sort of the copyright royalty side, which is very much mediated by contract. So contract accounting is really key. And contract accounting, when you start to look at accounting statements, it's horrifying. At least I was horrified. I, I, one of my areas of interest is accounting, long story there. It, it's horrifying the kind of accounting practices. This would be unacceptable in the general corporate context. It's one reason we have uh, companies issue audited financials. Maybe we should require some kind of audit similar. I think we should take from the experience of audited financials at the company level and apply it to this context as a starting point. Hey, Funmi, can I ask, can you stop sharing your screen so we can see you better? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Okay, next I have Willa Jean. Hi, 
I, this is I, this is so rich and wonderful. Uh, I was saying to Christine, I don't know what to ask. There's so much. So <laughs> I have two comments and and one question. Um, so the first comment was, this is really wonderful, and and thank you for all this work you you have uh, uh, and labor of love you've been putting into this. I can hardly wait to read it. Um, my second comment is if you haven't heard of Ranky Tanky, you should check them out. Um, it's a group that does Gullah music. Um, oh, yeah. And um, they got some notoriety uh, when um, they were heard on NPR um, and interviewed. So check out Ranky Tanky. Um, and my question is you were talking about blurred lines and uh, the gray zones there, how it was unclear what made acceptable or unacceptable borrowing. And um, there was a comment in, in the chat that said that this was to um, calculated to uh, produce chilling effects. So my question is, have you thought about ways in which the court could formulate ways um, to make it more, to make it transparent, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. Yeah, those are great questions. First of all, I'll look at Ranky Tanky is a folklorist. The Gullah have a long, Gullah culture has a long and storied sort of history in folklore because it's it's really, really, it's an interesting cultural context where you see a lot of um, African survivals. The culture there is just ama amazing from a, when we think about cultural hybridity and 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 how, and cultural retention. So I'll look at that. I hadn't, I hadn't been aware of that. Um, the blurred lines case, I think it, it points out that it's difficult to know, right? We have this, we've, we've, we've put a, a property like ownership template on cultural production and cultural production is intangible and the, where you draw lines can be very difficult. So I think we, we need to rethink, I mean, I think one, one, thing I, one thing I think we could do in some of these cases is we sort of take the original piece and say, well, how much does this second piece copy from that piece? And is it, is it, accept, is it amount of copying acceptable or unacceptable? I think we could take a, a much broader approach where we look at it in a more cultural way, where we say, you know, we first of all acknowledge a lot of music sounds alike. Um, a lot of, and it, this is true of classical music when it was a living tradition, popular music today in a particular genre, a lot of things sound alike. And that's just the reality of, of sort of similar people using similar themes coming from similar sources. And I think the question we need to determine is when is that copying too much given the broader cultural context of that musical tradition and who's actually doing the copying? I think we need to, I don't think copyright should be used for, for a gold rush purposes. Um, I, I don't think, so, so claiming ownership rights, what the early recording people were doing was claiming ownership rights so I can get the stream of income. And that had huge implications for cultural production, the shape of cultural production, as well as remuneration. So part of this is about remuneration. Um, I, I don't know if, I don't think I have an easy solution. I think it's a thorny area, but what I would observe is I don't think we've come very far since the days of Handel in resolving, resolving this question of how much is too much. Um, I tend to think, you know, my listening to the so two songs and my sense of Mot the broader Motown context when Marvin Gaye was created, I tend to think that that, that piece for me would fall on the side where it, it's, 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 it sh shouldn't have been infringement. Um, but that said, I think they should have settled the case. Um, I think that case, from what I've heard about the um, the litigation, I, I, it doesn't sound like the, um, given that they actually sought declaratory ju judgment, I thought that the Robin Thicke and Pharrell side didn't seem very well prepared. I think the gay estate had excellent lawyers. Um, I've heard the lawyers speak in a couple of different contexts. Um, and I also think that, um, they, again, they should have settled that case. I, I think there's, there's a lot, we, we won't, we'll never resolve all the gray area, but I do think we maybe need, need courts to take more culturally informed views of, of borrowing that, that recognize that borrowing happens, but how do we decide what's too